Hello and welcome to a special edition update from Ohio Health EMS. My name is Eric Cortez and I serve as the System EMS Medical Director. I'm joined today by Dr. Drew Kauna, one of our EMS physicians and phys physician advisors for outreach education. Drew, thank you for joining me today. Ah, thanks for having me, Eric. This is uh, exciting stuff. So our, our topic for this special edition update is the COVID-19 vaccine. Over the past few weeks, we've had a lot of updates and progress being made on COVID-19 vaccines. And we wanted to provide an update to our EMS partners regarding this topic. Uh, over the next 25 minutes or so, we're gonna talk about some background information about why we vaccine individuals for certain diseases. We'll talk about specific processes for the COVID-19 vaccine. We'll discuss the safety and effectiveness of the COVID-19 vaccine. And then lastly, we'll finish up with next steps and what to expect in the next six to 12 months after the vaccine rolls out. So we'll start with some background information. Why do we vaccine against certain disease, Drew? Yeah, uh, vaccinations are an incredibly important part of public health and societal health. And, and this is a really important day for us to be talking about this, Eric, because uh, it's December 14th when we're recording this. We'll get this rolled out. It is the first day that uh, we are beginning to vaccinate against the coronavirus. So as we're speaking right now, there are medical providers around the country that are getting a shot for this vaccine with many more uh, vaccinations to come. But when we talk about getting vaccinated, it's something that the vast majority of us, and I realize that when we talk about society and public health, not everybody gets vaccinated, not everyone believes in it for various reasons, and that's okay, but the vast majority of the population gets vaccinated. And when we think of vaccinations, you know, really the, the flu vaccine, the influenza vaccine, I think is the one that people think most uh, prevalently of up until uh, coronavirus, but, but we are vaccinated throughout our entire childhood and adulthood. And, and let's go back to talk about the need to decrease or even eradicate certain really, really uh, virulent, really deadly and disastrous diseases. Talk about uh, polio and smallpox. So the reason that we don't experience polio and smallpox in any significant manner as a society, at least not in, in a first world country, uh, is because we have been vaccinated and previously throughout history over the last 50 plus years, we've been vaccinated against these diseases and have gotten herd immunity to the point that it has essentially eradicated uh, those, those viruses that have been devastating prior to vaccination. Uh, think about um, children growing up in iron lungs because they had polio or smallpox really uh, devastating and knocking out uh, vast majorities of populations, including when um, you know, the Americas were, were originally, quote unquote, discovered uh, by, by Europe. Um, and so fast forward to that, now we go through regular vaccinations through childhood uh, based on a, a vaccine uh, regimen to get uh, some immunity uh, to several, several different kinds of diseases that either can be really prevalent and spread very, very rapidly if we don't have some immunity towards or can be really uh, devastating individually. And so when we talk about where we are now with the coronavirus, we're at a um, virus that is a mix of both. It spreads really rampantly throughout the community. And for some people, those infections are really, really devastating. So is coronavirus itself a, a gigantic killer? I, you know, honestly, I don't know, right? There's a lot of debate to be had about that. But the effect that it's having currently on our medical society and society in general is really, really huge. So having a vaccine to dampen that down, I don't know that we can er eradicate COVID-19 and the coronavirus or this strand of the coronavirus, but we can certainly gain control over it and really diminish its effects on on public health and society. Now, individual preferences are something completely different. We're not gonna come close to talking about that on, on this episode, but that's kind of a, a real big overview of why vaccinate. And there's a lot of different ways that we can vaccinate. We'll talk really briefly about the different technologies that are coming into play. Yeah, thanks, Drew. That's a nice overview. Uh, and you bring up a good point. There's certainly a lot of benefits to vaccination in society and from a public health perspective. And our goal of relaying this information is to allow you to make an informed decision about whether you want to proceed with the COVID-19 vaccine. In regards to uh, the goals of a vaccination program for any disease, there are a few things to keep in mind. Uh, certainly a vaccine can help prevent a disease from occurring. An example of this would be the hepatitis B vaccine where throughout childhood schedules, uh, you receive hepatitis B vaccinations, and you're pretty much um, guaranteed to not get hepatitis B later on in life, depending on certain things. 
But that's an example of a vaccine that prevents disease. A lot of other vaccines either affect the duration or severity of the illness. And Drew, you brought up the flu vaccine and we receive flu vaccinations each year, not so much in an attempt to prevent in being infected with the flu, but it helps reduce complications, duration and severity of illness, which are all important and help reduce spread as well. And as you alluded to as well, uh, all those are from an individual perspective, but we also got to remember the concept of herd immunity, which you uh, used the polio example and the smallpox example of, of, of mass vaccination programs that help create herd immunity, which essentially eliminated uh, multiple disease entities from the population in general. Um, Drew, a question for you. Um, when we get down to the specifics of a vaccine, when, when somebody's administered a vaccine, what are we administering into the body and how does the body respond to that? Yeah, so traditionally what we have administered into the body have really fallen fall into a couple different things, which is a mainly a viral vaccine. So it's been a weakened or an inactivated version of the virus is what we've been receiving. And what that is, is it's, it's a virus um, that is not strong enough to cause a, a full-blown illness in the person, but it is strong enough to initiate a reaction to the body, so an immune response, which is why people will often say after receiving the influenza vaccine that, that they felt like they got the flu. Um, you didn't actually get the flu. You got a much, much more mild version of it, and that's your body's immune response to it. And that's because that is a, a weakened or, or inactivated virus that's actually being um, distributed into your body, injected into your body. Now, we've moved forward a lot with um, COVID and some other vaccines, and, and we're looking at some really different technologies. So for coronavirus, they are looking at weakened and inactivated viruses as some viral vectors. That's not what's getting distributed today or is what's going to get distributed in the first couple rounds of vaccines. What um, received uh, approval from the emergency use authorization in the U.S. and a couple other countries is actually a nucleic acid uh, vaccine where they're using pieces of RNA um, to go into a cell, which then prompt the cell, in this case, to um, build a, a small portion of the virus. So you're not building the virus. So when, when we get vaccinated, it, um, you know, in the next couple of weeks, I expect to be vaccinated for this, and I will take it, and we can talk about that later on. But when I get the injection, or the people getting the injections today in the U.S., what they're getting is they're getting a piece of RNA that's going to insert itself into a cell and tell certain cells in the body to produce a spike protein from the coronavirus. So not the entire coronavirus, but a spike protein. And the spike protein is a piece of the shell, which is why it's actually called the coronavirus, because it makes it kind of look like a crown, has all these spikes coming off of it. And that is going to allow the body to say, this isn't normal. This is an invasion by a virus in this situation. And it's going to uh, force the body or or encourage the body to create an immune reaction to that. So you'll build up uh, defenses to now a coronavirus should you get it based on these spike proteins that exist on, on the coronavirus that we're currently experiencing. There's some other things too. There's viral vectors where you actually are using a different virus uh, to do a very similar thing where you um, will use a, a different type of coronavirus or a weakened measles virus or something like that, adenovirus and inject that into the body that has some similarities um, or um, production that will cause a similar immune reaction. There's some protein-based vaccines uh, in the works also where you're gonna inject a certain protein strand into the body that will cause the same or a similar immune response. And all this is basically to build a memory within your immune system. So now when it sees again, something that looks like the vaccine that it got, whether it is the spike protein, the viral vector, the protein-based vaccine, or just the inactivated or weakened vaccine itself. Now, the, the body already has an, uh, an army in its immune system to fight this off and prevent you from getting an infection or getting as severe an infection. What's really cool about where we are in uh, the coronavirus uh, vaccine right now is we have seen advancement in uh, viral uh, or, or uh, vaccine technology really explode. This isn't new. Nothing that we're doing right now is new. This is technology that's been studied for a long time, but it's the first time we've had the opportunity um, from a biochemical standpoint to really mass produce and enact a lot of the technology. So I, I kind of fact check uh, number one maybe for this episode is that a lot of people are concerned because we are doing something we've never done before. And that's true in the sense that we've never developed a vaccine as a society, as a medical society, as quickly as we're developing the coronavirus vaccines, and there's multiple of them out there. But what we're not doing is we're not starting from scratch. We started from a really elevated point in vaccine development, 
where what we had to do is figure out what part of the coronavirus or what part of the vaccine needed to be used to cause the proper immune response, not starting with brand new technology. The technology that is being injected today into somebody's arm is technology that has existed for at least a decade and has been used to develop other vaccines that have just never gone into mass production. Thanks, Drew. That was really helpful. Um, you know, uh, from from a from a vaccine standpoint, you know, there's a lot of different ways to introduce the vaccine into the body. And there's a lot of ways that we can create an immune response in the body, but it all comes down to whether it's RNA or DNA or proteins that make up the vaccine. We're getting our body to create antibodies. And that's basically what, what we have happen when we're infected with a virus or bacteria. We're just avoiding that infection and we're getting the antibodies as a result of that that can help create immunity to a given condition. And uh, you bring up some really good points about the technology used to create the COVID-19 vaccines. This has been a long time in the making. And uh, I, I wanna transition with that point into the processes and procedures that have occurred with COVID-19 vaccination. All that stuff that, that Drew brought up about, um, about the science behind it, that's been building up. And uh, from a federal level, from an approval level, all this stuff matters because these techniques have been demonstrated in the past, which is why a lot of the process for the COVID-19 development of the vaccine has been streamlined. It's the science, the technology behind it that has really uh, been occurring behind the scenes for quite some time. Um, so when a vaccine is being developed, all these things need to be demonstrated, and that's those have been checked off the list already. One thing that has not been streamlined and the thoroughness and the depth at which these vaccines have been evaluated by federal and national authorities um, is the safety aspect of things. Nothing has been abridged. Everything has been thorough and very invasive in regards to the safety evaluation of the COVID-19 vaccines. Uh, but step-by-step, step, what happens is you have a bunch of researchers that develop these vaccines, and they have to be FDA-approved. And once they're FDA-approved, then they can move on to the CDC for uh, recommendations for a given disease entity like COVID-19. And uh, the CDC, the FDA have done this, and the CDC has recommended in the period over the next several months, I imagine, where supply is not going to meet demand, that we have to prioritize individuals that receive the vaccine. And healthcare personnel, essential industries, uh, at-risk at populations are going to be prioritized. And uh, EMS providers fall within the healthcare provider tier, the, the, the top tier. The vaccines will be distributed to the state. And um, for all intents and purposes, in the state of Ohio, it, it's um, coming through the Ohio Department of Health, and then vaccines will be distributed to local and county health departments, hospitals and healthcare systems, pharmacies, physician practices, and so forth. Uh, so for, for, for the most part in the state of Ohio, EMS providers will get access to the vaccine through their local or county health departments. Uh, and this is how the COVID-19 vaccine will trickle down from the federal level down into uh, to the local health departments and healthcare systems, and then uh, to you as a provider that has access to the vaccine. Um, so with that said, let's transition into uh, some of the safety issues that have, um, that have been talked about uh, with the COVID-19 vaccine. Drew, can you comment on the what what type of safety issues are studied when we're looking at a vaccine, and in particular COVID nineteen? And can can you talk a little bit about allergic reactions versus an immunogenic reaction? Yeah, so these all vaccines. Whenever you're bringing something new pharmaceutically to to bear to be distributed uh, in the manner that these vaccines are going to be distributed, they go through a, a lot of of background uh, trials and research. That you alluded to, Eric. So, from a safety standpoint, um, so let's talk specifically about the Pfizer vaccine because that's the one that is uh, getting injected right now. There's a really long number that goes on with it. Uh, very not creative at all. BNT one six two B two mRNA COVID nineteen vaccine. Say that five times fast to get out there. 
So in order to do this, this, this vaccine and Pfizer with its partners and the, the U.S. government, as well as in multiple other countries, did a randomized double-blinded study of how this vaccine works. And when we say randomized double-blinded study, what that means is we, we got in this situation just shy of, of 44,000 participants. Um, to engage in this study uh, greater than 16 years old, and they were injected either with a placebo or with the actual vaccine. And, and I'm talking about Eric's specialty right now because I'm getting into the nerdy uh, uh, trial science, so he's going to correct me at some point. But when we say double-blinded, we're talking about neither the person giving the injection nor the person receiving the injection know what is in it, right? So this is all coded multiple levels back so that there, there's no – or mitigate as much bias as possible as far as both what symptoms you get as well as what the actual efficacy of the vaccine is. And then what we do is we, we monitor parallel tracks. So there's people that got the placebo vaccine and there's people that got the actual vaccine. And in this situation, we're looking for uh, safety events that occur. And we're also looking for immune response uh, and efficacy against the virus. When we talk specifically about safety events, what we're talking about is both allergic reactions which is when you think about somebody who has an allergic reaction to peanuts or shellfish or something like that, you have a true allergic reaction. So that is in the form of, of hives or, or swelling, angioedema, a true anaphylaxis. That is incredibly rare in these vaccines. And in fact, no significant difference between the placebo and the vaccine uh, given at this point. Now, we've heard on the news that we've stopped these trials a couple of times for different um, vaccines because there was a safety event. In a couple of cases, that was an allergic reaction. Sometimes it was something else that was uh, really unexpected, like a Guillain-Barre or a weird neurological disorder. And then the question becomes, is the event that occurs something that outpaces what you would expect for this person's natural medical progress anyway? So in, in a certain percentage of society, X number of people get Guillain-Barre. And if the X number of people that get Guillain-Barre that receive the vaccine doesn't exceed that, or exceed that a placebo, then we deem that it was not necessarily vaccine related, right? Because there's not a change in the frequency of a certain disease process. And then you get into the immunogenic responses. That's what we get oftentimes when you get the flu vaccine or another vaccine. It's as little as maybe some muscle soreness or fatigue just in the site of the injection. Sometimes it is a low grade fever, it's myalgias, um, it's a headache. And it's some of those things that you think of with a, a mild viral illness. Uh, that go along with it. That is not an allergic reaction. That is not you getting the true illness itself, but rather that is an immunological response that is actually showing that your immune system is responding appropriately to the vaccine you received. So in the situation of the, the uh, vaccine currently being distributed, local um, or vaccine recipients had some local reactions. They had some pain, some erythema, and some swelling in the injection site. Those are all to be expected after receiving an injection. And they did have some systemic reactions, fever, headache, and myalgias at a higher rate than the placebo, also to be expected. Um, and they had kind of a, a second round of that with the second dose, because this current vaccine requires two doses to get a full immunologic response. But almost everybody um, that received the actual vaccine categorized these as mild to moderate and rapidly resolving. So you know, it's, it's a little bit of pain and uh, it's a little bit of displeasure, but in this situation, we think the payoff is going to be really significant with a roughly 90 to 97% vaccine efficacy rate as far as preventing significant illness from COVID-19. Now, again, that's preventing significant illness. That's not preventing illness completely. And what we don't know is what it means for transmitting coronavirus if you get exposed to it, but for the actual person, really limiting um, how severe the symptoms are, preventing them from having to go to the hospital, certainly hopefully preventing them from going to the ICU and being on a ventilator and those really big downstream societal effects that we're trying to prevent. Yeah, the, the I think it's key, the difference between SARS-CoV-2 and COVID-19 disease the virus versus the clinical manifestation of a, of the virus infection. And what we're looking at with the COVID-19 vaccine, uh, specifically the ones that have been studied, is probably an efficacy that mirrors the efficacy that we see with the flu, where we're preventing uh, duration, severity, and potentially complications from the virus rather than preventing infection at all. So that's important when we talk about next steps following vaccination. And we know that, you know, there's a lot of goals that we have with the vaccine where we're uh, trying to stay safe ourselves, but also looking to create some herd immunity for population health and public health. 
Um, we know that, you know, based on Drew's comments and the recently published study that there may be some allergic reactions, there may be some immunogenic reactions, but the overall safety is, is well studied. It was thoroughly investigated in the, in the COVID-19 vaccine that we're talking about uh, appears to be safe. Um, and from the efficacy standpoint, we know that it, it's probably going to reduce the disease burden. But we still could have individuals that have received the vaccine still have the virus that they can spread. So moving forward, at least for the you know the next few months, and I would anticipate the next six months or so, or even more, we still need to be diligent with our uh, basic public health measures of you know face mask, PPE when, during patient encounters, and social distancing, because the virus can still be spread despite vaccination status. One thing that may change, and there's some speculation around this, is the quarantine requirements of uh, asymptomatic significant exposures may be reduced or even eliminated potentially. Uh, so those may be changing in the future, but as of right now, the same quarantine uh, requirements are still in place. Um, Drew, do you have anything else to add or any closing thoughts about the COVID-19 vaccine? Yeah, I think there's a, a couple couple closing thoughts uh, that are important to say. We, we've compared it a lot to the flu vaccine, the influenza vaccine. And from an efficacy standpoint, I think it's really important to note that the COVID vaccine, as it's been studied thus far, appears to be significantly more um, effective as far as efficacy goes than what we see on the yearly influenza vaccine. So yearly influenza vaccine, if we get 40 to 50 percent efficacy in preventing disease, we're pretty excited. We've done a really good job. We're talking about 95% are the numbers that we're seeing right now, give or take. And that's both the, the Pfizer vaccine as well as the next one that may get approval in the coming days, which is the Moderna vaccine, which is a very similar um, mRNA vaccine. We don't have the information on some of the other ones, although they're looking to be 70, 80, 90% on the initial data. Um, so it's important to know that this vaccine does look, at least in the short term, to be significantly more effective than what we typically experience in the flu vaccine. So if that's a little more um, encouragement potentially for some people to get it as they're making this decision and weighing the cost and benefits, that's really important to remember. I do think that you, mean, you bring up a great point. What we're going to know and how effective this is going to be is we're going to find out kind of in that three to six month range after we get uh, vaccines started or within a month or so of widespread community vaccination, which is not where we're at right now. Right now we're looking at high risk vaccinations. But once we start doing widespread community vaccination, if we see significant drops, um, curvilinear like drops in, in the um, new infection rate, so that R number, if we start driving that R0 down, significantly where the rate of spread is, is diminishing, then we'll know that this vaccine has been effective in preventing spread amongst people that have been vaccinated, as well as potentially amongst people that haven't been vaccinated, just because we lose the people as a as a asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic transition point. Now, I'm with you 100%. I think for the next six plus months, we're going to be wearing PPE in the hospital, um, whether at some point over the next couple of months, we can get rid of having to wear N95 masks uh, for a lot of patients and really just our high risk COVID patients who are wearing a surgical mask all the time or not yet to be seen. I don't know. Um, but I suspect for the majority of 2021 that at least in the medical setting, we'll be wearing um, at least surgical mask face protection. And I think that's just a good thing to be doing, right? Even if um, I've been vaccinated and we don't think that I'm spreading the disease, if I can limit one other person from getting it um, and prevent that one person from spreading it somewhere else or just that one person from having a bad effect, then I've done my job as a healthcare provider just being conscientious uh, as far as that goes. As far as society goes, when uh, mask wearing comes down, that's going to really largely depend on that, that rate of spread. And once we've decreased that rate of spread significantly, then we can start talking about removing masks in public. Yeah, those are excellent points. A few more random thoughts, too. Number one, the, the vaccine that we're talking about, it's for adults 18 years and older as of right now. Um, one question that sometimes comes up, well, if I've had COVID, do I need the vaccine again? And uh, from what I've heard, while supplies are limited, uh, if you had COVID-19 in the past 90 days, you'll probably uh, probably need to wait, you know, depending on local protocol, because the chance of being reinfected within 90 days of an index infection is exceedingly low. But you'll still have ac access to it after that 90 days, from what I'm told and read. Uh, if you have chronic medical problems, if you're immunosuppressed, you know, m make sure you're checking with your personal physicians because there are some contraindications 
that go into these vaccines. And we don't want to get into the specifics on on this update, but make sure you're checking with your physicians when you have chronic medical problems also. Uh, and lastly, I think we all need to make our, our own decision regarding this vaccine. You know, everything in medicine and your healthcare is a risk benefit analysis. You know, if I do this, what's the risk and benefit? And, and if I don't do this, what's the risk and benefit? And it appears that the COVID-19 vaccine, it appears to be effective. You know, we don't know if this is going to be a yearly vaccine that we need, if it's going to concur long-term immunity. There's a lot to be worked out in that regard. But we do know that it's effective at all the things that we mentioned about COVID-19 disease. Uh, we, I feel pretty good about the safety of the vaccine. It's been extensively studied. Uh, so we, we just want you to be able to make a very informed decision when you make that personalized risk-benefit analysis about whether you're going to get the vaccine. Um, I, I'm personally going to get the vaccine. Drew said he's going to get the vaccine. Uh, and I think as we get more and more supply, then we'll move from these these uh, top tier prioritized uh, cohorts to the general population. And I expect that the um, that the benefits of the vaccine are um, are going to become more and more apparent as well. Um, I want to thank everybody for your time. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to reach out to me at eric.cortez at ohiohealth.com. Uh, if it's for Drew specifically, I can forward it on to him as well. We're happy to answer any questions regarding COVID-19 and the COVID-19 vaccine. Uh, thank you for your time. Stay safe.